This is part one of the introduction to typography lecture for the beginning typography class. And in this lecture, we'll cover the history of typography and the written word and how that applies to graphic designers and typesetting today. Typography is the study of the written word and how it is arranged, presented, and displayed. The study of typography is of great importance to the field of graphic design and is integral to successful graphic communication. Typography is really the most direct way that we are able to communicate with our audience since the written word is able to be read and deciphered into content. And the way that we set and treat these words is of great importance to our profession. This is Bodoni, a modern style typeface that originated in Italy. We're looking at type on a large scale and we can see the details and intricacies designed within these forms. But when we look at them even bigger, we can see that there's even more details. This is Cuesta, a project that was created by Jos Bavinga and Martin Major. It's a serif typeface that has incredible beauty. You can see these curves and special forms that really make this a very unique typeface. And when we look at these at large sizes, we're really able to appreciate these details and intricacies that are meant to be appreciated at large sizes but also work at small sizes to not be distracting for the reader. We also deal with text for reading, long settings of text. It's very important that we're able to set copy in these types of situations as they're integral for us to create things like books and newspapers. This is Walbum, a serif typeface that you're seeing set here in these two paragraphs. Typography is an area of study where understanding its origin and history is very important. Technological changes and advancements are at the core of type history and are a catalyst to its overall evolution. If we look at the overarching history of typography, it's really technology that influences and changes the entire industry. And so really understanding those changes and how they end up affecting the field of typography is very important. But we're really going to start with the evolution of the written word. How did we get to the Latin alphabet that we have today? And we'll look at some of the highlights of evolution that really draws to this point. And that really begins with hieroglyphics, which are really ideograms. These were used by the Egyptians. Hopefully they're familiar to you. They're shapes or pictograph type symbols that convey meaning. So whatever we're looking at is ultimately what the meaning of these forms are. They're not a phonetic alphabet like the one we have today that is sound based. It's much, much different. This is still a system that's used by alphabets like Chinese and some forms of Korean and Japanese where there are actually symbols that relate to a specific item, topic, or object. Then we get to cuneiform, and these are these wedge-shaped marks that were chiseled into soft clay. And this was developed by the Sumerians, and it initially started as an ideogram-based alphabet, but there are evidence that some of it evolved into somewhat of a phonetic alphabet. But eventually it was taken over by Phoenician, which is the first actual phonetic alphabet that we find. So it started with some ideogram and pictorial based writing, but evolves into a completely phonetic alphabet that is the basis of the kind of alphabets that we use today in Western culture. This then evolved into Greek, and then eventually the Greek was evolved into the Roman forms that we know today. This is particularly the Trajan column, which is known as one of the most beautiful inscriptions of Roman capitals in existence. This is often viewed as one of the greatest examples of Roman capitals. And at this point, we have 23 uppercase letter forms. There's no J, U, or W, but we have all of the other characters, and they're very familiar to us in terms of how they look today in our language. Here's an example of Trajan as it was redesigned or revived by Carol Twombly at Adobe. You can see that monumentality, the beauty in these forms, and this was really based off of a study of the work of the Trajan column. We also have the evolution of the written words. So we've looked at how letters and forms were carved or inscribed into stone, but there was also a history of people writing, and that really begins with rustic capitals, and these are really based on the Roman capitals that we've been looking at. But you can tell there's more of a running hand, there's a, a simplicity that's introduced, more of a casual nature in the way that this is rendered and drawn by the scribe themselves. And that evolves into uncials and half uncials. And that's really where we see the beginning of lowercase letter forms. And that's really important because up to this point, we have most of the 26 capital letter forms, but we're missing those lowercase. And so through the development of the uncials and the half uncials, 
we really end up seeing these lowercase letter forms come into their own and develop into something that's a little bit more recognizable to what we see today. This is an example of half unchul work or similar to half unchul work. This is the Book of Kells that was done in Ireland. It is one of the greatest examples of this kind of calligraphy and it is intensely beautiful. You can see all of these amazing decorative elements that surround all of the text. Then we get to Carolingian minuscule, and this is really pushed by the rule of Charlemagne. This was a type of text or writing that was extremely popular, and once the church and Charlemagne backed this type of writing, it had an incredible reach. And then through trends, we eventually see Gothic minuscule, which really followed the rest of the Gothic tradition, and it really took form and eventually was the basis for the type of typography we saw in the Gutenberg Bible. And then lastly, we see humanist minuscule, and this was really developed in Italy, and it really is the closest to what our lowercase letter forms look like today. So you can really see that evolution of how through the Unchuls and the Carolyn minuscule, we were really able to define and develop those lowercase 26 characters, which are really integral to typography today. Because now at this point, we finally have a standardization of how these 26 uppercase letters and 26 lowercase letters should look. Here's a chart that shows the evolution of the alphabet. So you can see that from Phoenician on the left, where we have that first phonetic alphabet, all the way over to Hebrew, Greek, Etruscan, Latin, Classical Latin, and then over to Gothic, and then our modern Latin alphabet. But you can see how these forms evolved over time. Some of them simplified, some of them didn't exist and were created. But it's really important to us having this set of characters that are standard today. Here's another chart that shows some of the evolution of the handwriting, so how they influence each other and how they relate to each other over time. And then ultimately we get to the Gutenberg Bible. The Gutenberg Bible is probably one of the most important advancements of modern printing and typography. Gutenberg is credited in the Western world of developing the printing press and movable type. And he began printing in 1439, but the Bible was not printed until 1455. This is an etching that shows an example of what Gutenberg's press looked like. So this was an amazing advancement because it allowed individual pieces of type to be set and locked up and then printed. And the advantage of this was that pages could be printed multiple times with one setting. Historically, up to this point, scribes would transcribe pages of the Bible over and over. And it was an incredibly tedious task. And for many people, it was their life's work. But the ability to spend time setting one page of text and then printing a few hundred pages off of that setting was incredible. It changed the world and it really allowed for more information to become available. So the world changes entirely, information becomes easier to disseminate, and knowledge becomes more democratically available. Ideas are able to spread more quickly and further than ever before. And this really changes many things in the world. It's, a lot of it is the creation of democracy, the spreading of ideas and ideals, the spreading of different religions becomes possible because of this type of technology. The technology that Gutenberg created we would now refer to as letterpress today. Here's an example of a letterpress setting. So here we have a type stick that is shown with letters inside of it. The drawer behind it shows small compartments where lead type is kept. So each of those compartments is actually a separate letter form. And the type setter would actually grab the letters they need and set them into the stick to create the ultimate setting. One thing you'll notice is that they're actually setting upside down and backwards. So that's a particular challenge of letterpress setting even today where you have to be able to really read and look at the type even though it is upside down and backwards. Here's an example of a modern piece of letterpress type. So you can see this body or the main part of the piece of type. And then we have things like the groove and foot and nick that are really technical pieces that help the type work together. But then we have point size that you see there down there at the bottom. And that is really determining the size of this typeface. So you'll notice what's interesting here in lead type is it's actually not the size of the actual type, it's the size of the entire body or shank. You also notice that the top of it is called face, and that's really where the term typeface comes from. It's that raised portion at the top we're seeing here with an H that actually creates the impression on paper. So letterpress type is really made from punches. So historically there were punch cutters and they were master engravers or carvers. Many of them came from some kind of metalwork. Oftentimes they were jewelers or goldsmiths. And they would painstakingly create these punches. And so you can see examples here of these. So these are the masters. So they would be created and then the punches would ultimately be used to create all of the type 
that existed. So again, there was one person who really spent time carving these things. They were carved at individual sizes. So although now in modern day typography with fonts and typefaces, we're able to scale and make these letter forms any size we want, this is a physical product. So the punches would actually have to be created at different sizes ultimately to be able to create the typeface at various sizes. So that was a painstaking part of this process, but it also allowed for an incredible amount of optical corrections to happen. The punch cutter was able to make adjustments as these typefaces got larger to really in keep the integrity of these letter forms and to really master their form over the scaling of these different letters. So here's a little process of how the punch becomes the type. So if we look at the left, we have that beautiful punch that's created. So that's created at a specific typeface at a specific size. And then that punch is actually punched into a matrix. So we're seeing that next one over. So that M is actually punched into soft metal. And then the matrix is actually what we'll use to create the type. This really protects the integrity of the original punch. If the punch was being used over and over, it would degrade over time. But by allowing the matrix to be the workhorse here, it protects the original work of the punch cutter. Then that matrix is put into the bottom of a mold, as you're seeing in that third image. And then metal is poured into that mold and ultimately creates that piece of type we see on the right. So this would happen for all of the letter forms. And keep in mind that most of these typefaces when they were purchased would have multiple E's and multiple M's or certain characters that were used over and over. So it was quite a painstaking process to create an entire set of type that would be purchased. Type comes in drawers. So this is what we would see today. This is a type drawer. And you can see again that all of the letter forms fit in these different slots. You can also get an idea of how many pieces of type would actually have to be created for us to have a full set of type. So it was quite a bit of work. Historically, we had an upper and lower case, and that's really where that terminology comes from. Here you're seeing the layouts of these drawers. So you can see at the top, we have on the left all of the uppercase, and then on the right, the small caps. And the bottom, we have punctuation and all of the lowercase. What's also interesting about that is you can see that E's have more than V's or Z's. So there's really an emphasis on creating more characters that we need more often for the English language. Eventually this went away and we had a California job case, which combined upper and lower case together, which allowed an entire typeface to be in one drawer, which was particularly useful. So keep in mind, these things are made of lead. They're incredibly heavy. So setting type was a very laborious task. It's not so simple as it is today on the computer. You were actually physically moving type, picking up type, moving drawers, finding other drawers of different sizes that would be mixed together. You also don't have the ability to make a lot of changes. You really have to work with the type that you have. And I think it's important to understand this process because it's so different from what we do today. So let's get into some of the people who created type. We'll start with Nicholas Jensen, who worked in Venice. He was alive from 1420 to 1480. And through these slides, I'll often have a piece of art or art history here. And this is just a reference point for you as you go through the lectures. This is the work of Botticelli. So he was also working in Italy. This is his Primavera, and this painting was painted during Nicholas Jensen's lifetime. Here's some of his work. This is an example of Jensen's original work. He created a gorgeous Roman. He was originally a goldsmith, and he was eventually sent to Mainz in Germany to study type production. So he went to Germany and learned with Gutenberg and some of his contemporaries, and then went on to go back to Italy and build on the Italian models and make some of the most gorgeous typography that we know of in Roman style. He was also one of the first non-German typographers and he really helped take the craft of typography to Italy, which is where it would move after Germany and have quite an evolution in that region of the world. Here's an example of Robert Slimbach's revival of Jensen. This was done for Adobe. And you can see how he's really looked at the forms of Jensen and reinterpreted them. So this type originally existed in lead when it was created by Jensen. But now that we're in a digital age, Robert Slimbach has gone back for Adobe and looked at these original renderings of Jensen and interpreted it and made it in a new digital way. So this is a process we'll see often. It's referred to as revival, where we go back and look at a typeface that doesn't exist in a current form of technology and we recreate it for that technology. So here Robert Slimbach's going back and looking at the lead type work and he's really reinventing it for the computer in a digital way. Then we have Aldous Manutius. He was also working in Italy and he was really a scholar and a businessman. 
He was really somebody who ran an incredible printing empire, and he was very smart in who he hired and worked with. He worked often with Francesco Griffo, and he was in charge of really creating some of the first italic type. It was some of the most gorgeous typography, and it was really made for space saving. That was really what he was after in terms of the goal of creating this typography. So up until this point, there's no thinking of using italic for emphasis. It's not for a book cover or a record title. It's really just about the beauty of the form. And it's really created initially to create more of a space-saving type of typography because the angle allows you tight faces to become more tightly set. On the left, you'll see Aldous's logo. And this is really one of the first times we see someone using a logo. He adopted this from the town that he was in, and it's a fish surrounding an anchor. So it's really interesting that on top of him being this amazing businessman, he's also one of the first people that we ever see that uses a symbol to represent himself. Then we have Ludovico Vincentino Delghi Arighi, and he was also in Italy and created some of the most beautiful and consistent italics that we've seen. They're very masterful. His ability to keep the angle and the stroke weight consistent was unparalleled, and he was really somebody who was very much known for his italics and their beauty. And they were really adopted by Slimbach for his version of Adobe Jensen. Because the initial Jensen typefaces didn't have an italic version, he went back historically at the work of Arigi, since it was contemporary to Jensen, and used his beautiful italic work as the basis for Jensen's italic. So we get to Francesco Griffo. So he would have seen The Birth of Venus, also by Botticelli. We're still in Italy. And he worked very much with Aldous Manutius to create a series of gorgeous typefaces. Here's some of his work. He worked in Roman and Italic, and he was really known for the refinement he brought to his craft. Here's an example of a modern revival of Bembo, which is really based on Francesco Griffo's work. Then we have Claude Garamond. He would have been alive during the painting of the Sistine Chapel, although he lived in France and may have never seen it. And at this point, France now becomes the type center of the world. And it's mostly due to Garamond. He really develops and refines on the work of Francesco Griffo and builds some of the most beautiful old style typefaces that have ever existed. Here's an example of some of his work. There's a beauty and an elegance to these typefaces that really did not exist up until this point. Although Garamond did create a lot of gorgeous work, his work is often also misattributed and belongs to Jean Janin and Robert Grandjean. So oftentimes there's work that was done by them that is attributed to Garamond because some of their work was so similar and because there are gaps in historical records that help us know who created what. Here's an example of Adobe's Garamond. So this is a revival done by Adobe of the Garamond typeface. Then we have Jean Janin. So he was somebody who was a contemporary to Garamond, and again, a lot of his work was misattributed to Garamond. And he's really known for a lot of his work in Italic and Roman, but he's particularly known for working and setting these things together. Up until this point, this is really the first time that we see an Italic set with a Roman, and it done specifically so to create emphasis. And this is really the basis of how we use Italic today, so it was fairly groundbreaking. Then we move to Christopher Plantin, so now we're in Antwerp, we're up in Belgium and the Netherlands, which is where the type movement goes next in terms of its dominance in the world. And Plantin was famous for a lot of things, but one of them was that he purchased a lot of Garamond's punches after his death. And this allowed him to continue that legacy. And one of his large contributions to the type world was the creation of the Polyglot Bible. And what was interesting about that, it was printed in five languages, so it forced Plantin to really explore the creation of non-English typography, so looking at creating forms for other languages. Here's a typeface named for him. This is Plantin, although it was actually Robert Grandjean's work. Christopher Plantin, much like Aldous Minutius, was much of a businessman, and although he was involved and oversaw much of the typographic creation, he had other incredible people that worked for him as punch cutters. Then we go to France with the Romain du Roy. Romain du Roy is the name of a specific typeface that was commissioned by the King of France, and it was to create a typeface that could represent royalty which was quite a high ask. So Jacques Jean Jean, he worked as a project manager or as someone who oversaw this project. And Philippe Grandjean was somebody who created a lot of the actual type for this. And they worked on this project from about 1692 to 1745. This is during the creation of Versailles. This is really about opulence and creating something that is of beauty that is worthy of the King of France. 
So they really looked at some of the work of Joffrey Torrey, who at this point was really looking at gridding and rationalizing letter forms. So we're moving away from looking at more humanist construction methods where we're looking at how people draw and write based on the work of scribes. Now we're looking at how can we rationalize letter forms? How can we relate them to human anatomy or put them on some kind of a grid that lets us know where particular parts of the letter form should live? And this really gets taken to another extreme. This is the work of Romain de Roy. So you can see this intense gridding structure, these circles that are laid on top to define the geometry of the curves. And this really drove the creation of Romain de Roy. And one thing you'll notice through this is that there's a thinning out of the serifs and the different forms that becomes important. Because as we're looking at the evolution of serif typography up to this point, printing and ink and paper are also growing in quality, which is really allowing these punch cutters and typographers and printers to push the boundaries of what these letter forms can look like. Then we have William Caslon. So now we're finally in England, and he is one of the most prominent and famous English typographers to ever live. He created the typeface Caslon, which was incredibly popular. You can see it here. Not only did it come in a great amount of sizes and styles, you can also see that there's some foreign language styles on the right. But this was an extremely popular typeface, particularly in England and the United States. It was very groundbreaking in that way. And oftentimes people felt that it was the best typeface to use, and if you did not know what to use, you may as well just use Caslon. We actually see this in the initial draft of the Declaration of Independence. So they used Caslon for the setting of that document. He also created one of the first sans serif typefaces. So we see this in a specimen book, and it's the first time that we see sans serif typography. So typography without the feet or the serifs at the bottom of the letter forms. And then here's Carol Twombly's Caslon for Adobe, so a revival of Caslon that was done by Adobe. Then we go to George Bickham. He is an English engraver and calligrapher. He was really a master penman. And there was really Bickham the Elder and Bickham the Younger, and they worked in the same style and really carried on each other's legacy. But mostly what I'm showing here is from the Elder. He wrote a book called The Universal Penman in 1733 that was really groundbreaking in its showcase of calligraphic style and penmanship. He really advocated for proper penmanship and really pushed the use of the pointed pen to create these gorgeous, beautiful, high contrast forms. Here's another piece from Universal Penman, but you can see that beauty and that contrast between thick and thin strokes that is so characteristic here. Here's a revival of Bickham's script. So this was based on some of his calligraphic work. It was released by Adobe and designed by Richard Lipton in 1997. Here are the swash caps of the alphabet that are particularly gorgeous and really reminiscent of George Bickham's incredible swash style. So this work, along with the work of Caslon, really influenced John Baskerville, who was an English typographer. He lived from 1706 to 1775. So he died before our country was even formed, just for a reference point. And he pushed the thick-thin relationship even further. Here's an example of Baskerville's work. He really worked on thinning those areas out. He really took what George Bickham was doing in a calligraphic script way and applied it to serif letter forms. And this really created what we know now as a transitional letter form. So we've gone from old style typefaces that are more based on Roman and handwriting to something that's more transitional. And it's transitional because it's really pushing that thick thin relationship. It's really upping the contrast, which makes it different. Here's an example of a revival of Baskerville where you can really see the high contrast and transitional forms. And this was done by George William Jones for Adobe. Then we get to Francois Dedeau. Dedeau was really a printing family. He had two sons, Fermin and Pierre Dedeau, that also continued his legacy and did his work. So in Francois' day, he would have seen potentially or heard potentially about the portrait of George Washington. Keep in mind, we're just seeing the beginning of our nation, the United States. It's just now going through the Revolutionary War. And they create a new style of typeface. They take what Baskerville has done and push it even further. They really increase the contrast even more and push the amount of contrast that can be possible here to create a new typeface that we now know as Dedeau. It was released in 1784. So it was shortly after the Declaration of Independence and the closing of the Revolutionary War. And it really was this gorgeous typeface that had a high amount of style. It struggled to work in small sizes, but there were optical corrections that were made that helped it. But you can see in these large letter forms how much contrast there is. And it really creates what we now know as a modern style typeface. Here's an example of Hoffler's Dedeau. It's a gorgeous cut revival of this typeface. 
you can see that high sparkle, the thin, thin strokes that are contrasted by these heavy, heavy strokes. And it's really that combination of two things that create this sparkle on the page. They're oftentimes associated with high fashion that really just comes from the use of the typefaces in prominent magazines like Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. But there is a high beauty to these forms and the way that the contrast of the thin strokes really bounce off these heavy, thick strokes. Then in Italy, we have another type of modern that's created. We have Giambattista Bodoni, who lived from 1740 to 1813, and he created an Italian style modern, which is we know as Bodoni. And they're very similar, but they're not exactly the same. They also here pursued this thick, thin relationship. We have these thin thins and these thick thicks and the contrast of the two that make this a modern style typeface. But there's some differences in terms of how it was interpreted compared to Dodeau. Bodoni worked on his own and much of his work was released after his death, including this book, the Manual Typografico. It's hard to say which one came first. They were both probably influenced by the work of George Bickham and John Baskerville, and that really drove the creation of these typefaces. So here's ITC's Bodoni 72. This was created by Dmitry Kursanov. It is a great revival and example of Bodoni's form. You can see this high contrast, some interesting ball terminal shapes, like in the uppercase R, if you look at the bottom of that leg, there's a nice little ball terminal that comes up, and some other interesting ball terminals on some of the numerals. The Industrial Revolution and Machine Age drove an immense amount of innovation as well as commerce. For the first time, goods were mass-produced, resulting in the need to sell products. This created the need for advertising and branding. It also really changed typography. For the first time, we have people that are creating typography on a much more mass market scale because there's more of a need for typography. Up until this point, type has really been used for books and small publications. It's really about the written word, about publishing the classics in the Bible. But for the first time here, we have a need for typography to sell. And it changes the way that typography looks. For the first time, we start seeing different types of typefaces, things like slab serifs and shaded letter forms, and a lot of this kind of Victorian era setting where we have a lot of different typefaces being mixed together. That really came from a need to sell, to yell, to get someone's attention. So type goes through a massive transformation through this period. But up until this point, we've been really looking mostly at the thinning out of these letter forms. If we look across from old style and humanist typefaces all the way to the moderns on the right, you can see how there's really a slight adjusting of these forms to create more refinement and ultimately to create more rationality for how they're built. 